Hello and welcome to Prescott Reflects. It is the intention of the producer of this film to record, for posterity, some of the changes that have taken place in the town. In order to achieve this, we have solicited the help of some people associated with the town who have either witnessed or influenced these changes. Material has been gathered from many sources and the makers feel that it should be viewed essentially unedited to enable you to get the flavour of the town. Please sit back and enjoy the film. We've now come to the home of writer and local historian Arthur Roberts, who has very kindly agreed to be our guide as we make our way around Prescott. Arthur, how long have you been interested in local history? From the time when I was at Prescott Grammar School in 1922 to 26 and beyond, of course. Mm. I'm now Vice President of uh, Prescott Historic Society. Mm, uh, when did you take up writing? After I retired in 1974, yeah. seriously, and I've done six books since then. Yeah. On, uh, on, on the theme of yeah. uh, uh, Prescott's history. I was just going to mention that. You've had a number of books published. That's right. Do you have a favourite one? I think Prescott, when I was a boy, was the, is, is the most comprehensive. I started off with one on the, the parish church and, and, uh, and my connections with it, which covers six vicars and, and a long time. I mean, I started off, uh, I started off writing the uh, the history of the church itself, and I called it Prescott Parish Memories. Mm -hmm. Then I followed that with a thing called Prescott when I was a boy, which uh, sold fifteen hundred copies in no time, and I was persuaded later to collect make a collection of uh, as many photographs as I could uh, and uh, that I called Prescott of Yesteryear and that was done professionally by, well, financed by Shearwaters, yeah. the, the uh, developers. Yeah. And that sold 5,000 copies. Very good. Since then I, I, I put out another one which is a short history of the uh, Lady Margaret Bowling Club which celebrates its centenary this weekend. Yeah, did you get any feedback to it? Yeah. Do you get any feedback as far as your publication? You often know, do people um, write, write your letters, things like oh, that. Oh, heavens, yes. I, I've got a file here, letters from all over the world, virtually. Mm -hmm. So many folk have gone out from Prescott to, to emigrate, and people send the, the, the pictures uh, and the books, rather, to them for yeah. Christmas presents and those sort of things. And I've had letters, I've had about a dozen letters from Australia, and about the same number from New Zealand, some from, from uh, South America. I've even had one from Zimbabwe mm. uh, and several from South Africa. Mm. And uh, as recently as yesterday, I had an inquiry from a person in Accrington who picked up my book, I don't know where, and uh, she was uh, concerned in writing a, a family history. Uh, and her, her forebears came from Ireland in 1842 and, and landed in what was then called T Street. It's now mm. Leyland Street, of course. Yeah. And uh, she, she got the book from somewhere, uh, uh, some other library, and let her have it, I don't know. So she, she was on uh, for about an hour, mm -hmm. uh, asking me about the, the, the people that, that I can remember, which is, of course is much later than 1842. Uh, you know, sometimes you can get some people can be a bit critical, can't they, you know, looking for uh, errors and omissions of oh, your work, yeah. you know. Oh, yeah, well, well, can yeah. you explain, you know, like the sheer effort, effort needed? to get one of your projects off the ground? Well, it took me two years to collect all those photographs for the last book. The rest of the time I, I, I did in consultation with the reference library in Heighton, mm. and they did some photocopying for me. That took about two years. The other one, the first one, of course, took even longer because, I, I mean, I was getting maps of this and maps of yeah. that, and it was more a history of the church and my connection with it. But uh, I, I would say on average two to two and a half years to get each one going. Yeah. People don't be aware of that. No, they don't. And you talked about errors. Uh, you lay yourself wide open on this job mm. uh, for, for criticism. And there are all sorts of people who say, you missed our house out on, on, on that thing, or, or you, you were wrong there, that man didn't follow that man. Well, I, I've got done some careful checking, and in most cases I was able to put them right. Mm. And there were certain instances when I was wrong. I mean, I, let, let, let's admit it, nobody's perfect. Yeah, right. uh, and I, uh, I, I had this... Mm. Uh, Rather, rather un unpleasant uh, occasion when one lady down at All Saints Church and said to me, you know, you've got that wrong. Uh, uh, Harry Bradshaw wasn't here from those... I said, Harry Bradshaw was, because I was present when he was ordained in Prescott Parish Church. 
So, uh, I mean, that, that sort of thing. Her, her memory was not as good as mine in yeah. that instance, but there are other instances when uh, when my memory fails. I mean, heaven knows we're all, we're all uh, human, aren't we? I think that's it. Um, another thing, people think that because you've had material published, you must be rolling in money and have a Swiss bank account. <laughs> you know, what have you said to these people? Well, that's rubbish, because in, in, in most instances, I, I haven't made anything. I mean, I don't, I'm not doing it for money, I'm doing it to, to set the, the record uh, down because this place has changed so much that folk of my generation are, are about the last to know what it, what it was like. Mm -hmm. And I'm going back 80 odd years, so, uh, well, that, uh, I, I, can, I can cancel that out <laughs> altogether. I, I mean, I, I don't do it for money and I've made no money out of it, mm -hmm. but I've had a lot of joy from, yeah. from, from doing the job. It's the main thing, isn't yeah, it? It is, it is yeah. indeed. And a lot of encouragement too. Mm -hmm. So much so that I, I'm, I'm now regarded as the, the local historian. I mean, for, whether that's right or not, yeah. I, I don't yeah. know. But I've always been interested in history. And in fact, the man who started the Prescott Historic Society taught, taught at the grammar school just after I left there. And he and I were very good friends. Yeah. And the last book was uh, was published, was um, launched by J.J. Bagley, the late J.J. Bagley, who, who was uh, uh, Professor of History at Lancaster University in Liverpool. He came through Prescott quite a, a, a lot of times on his way to Liverpool. Yeah, yeah. So I, I've met some very interesting people while I've been doing this. Thing. Yeah. And the letters are testimony uh, itself of, of the acceptance of it. Yeah. And that gives me more pleasure than anything else. The, the, there's been no material gain. I've, the Swiss bank account, you can forget. A, 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 any uh, money that's come to me is mm. negligible. Mm -hmm. And for instance, on, on the last one, I, I sat in the... Uh, precinct when it was launched to sign the book and I, I, I was cheeky and I asked for a pound a time for the signature and I gave all that to the church. Very good. So Very I mean good. that's, uh, I made nothing out of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to. Yeah. Yeah. I want to set the history of Prescott down in, in, in black and white so that folks yeah. will know what went on here. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. precisely what you're doing with yeah. this, this uh, theme of yours. Yeah. yeah, it's very interesting that. Should we now make our way to the town centre? We'll do that, most certainly. Any yes. any, anything of interest, you know. You bet. Yes. Thanks yes. a lot. Yes, thank you very much indeed. Well, there's a narrow streets, I think, probably in the country, but certainly in, in Lancashire. Uh, and uh, as you can tell, uh, I mean, it's not a yard wide, is it? and uh, connects with the Highfield Place and, and what is now a car park. It's been going all my lifetime and uh, hasn't been used a lot, but it's it's the sort of place that uh, a photo comes in. Well, the thing lives in a place like this, David. Did you guess right? How long, how long have you been uh, Lord Speaker for the council? Uh, 12 years. You know, the town centre did too. It's a good job, I think it's worthwhile. Yeah. Someone told me you're the second most popular man in Prescott, is that true? I think Peter Kelly told me in actual fact. So, so what's the important thing? Yeah. Really. What's the cause of the cause? We need a lot next door, we need a lot next door, we need a lot What do you like about it? Well, it's out in the open air. Yeah. Yeah. It's out in the natural history as well. People are all telling me different things. Yeah. It's a good nature area, it's not like an open city. It's a great city. It's a great wild job. Interesting characters on the track. Oh, yeah, quite a few. Do you have any funny stories? Yeah. I do have a little scout We'll have to see you another time.
what it is, Arthur, actually, I've been busking now on this street here for about six months, say, once a week or twice a week. And definitely Prescott is the best town in the area. This and St. Helens. Right. No, seriously, this is a lovely town. And the interesting thing is, it's about seven miles from Liverpool, round about that. And yet there's a lot of Scouts feel here, and yet they're not Scouts, are they? Right, they are Prescott people, I've noticed a definite difference actually. But a great street and a great town. Can I play you a song? What can I do? A Prescott song. If we don't know any, that's the trouble. You'll have to have Mel there, right? <laughs> He'll write you a good one. I, I belong to Prescott, the old Prescott town. There's something. All right, you want to sing that one, Mel? Come on, come on here with me. Come here. You're the producer of this show. All right. I'm going to sing you a Liverpool song, just for the uh, people here in know Liverpool. And as soon as you know Liverpool tonight from Brighton, all right? Oh, Liverpool, love, Liverpool, love. Why don't you behave like the other girls do? Oh, why does my poor heart be hollow? shop under its proprietor Mr. David Rose has traded in Prescott Town Centre for many years. David has agreed to take part in this film to tell us a little bit about the history of his business. Well where we are now was in fact the workroom of Prescott Knitting Company when we moved here in 1932 for about 30 years after that. Uh, we had knitting machines down this wall here and I can remember here in this area there being a balling machine which even as a child I could operate and took a delight in winding the balls from yeah. the hanks before they came in so that we could operate on the machines. Yeah. We had two machinists, there was my auntie was Abram, yeah. Lee Abram, yeah. and uh, Edie Rogers who worked for us from a school right. girl yeah. at 14. Yeah. And she worked for us, that's right, yeah. and she worked for us for 48 years yeah. before yeah. she retired. Yeah. Uh, the business itself was started in 1919 but operated originally from a building in Lucas's yard behind this building and it was started as a knitting machine operation where hand operated machines made small garments, mainly socks, but other garments as well, and they were sold. Uh, there were Miss, two Miss Abrams, that's my aunt and my mother, uh, Nellie Abram, and two Miss Lucases, Gladys and Lena, hence that they were sighted on Lucas's yard. That partnership didn't really work out in the long term and the two Miss Lucases withdrew from the partnership after a couple of years. We had a shop then at the bottom of Eccleston Street number seven which um, was a small shop and the knitting machines were recited behind the shop 
and the shop was there to sell the goods that were made and other goods as well, yeah. hence knitting yarns. And it was in fact a general drapers yeah. selling knitting wools yeah. and the garments that were made. Now, the, in the, I came in, on the scene in the 1940s, and in a minute I'll show you where, which was my bedroom because we lived here in those days, and this was a house as well as a shop and a factory, I suppose, a workshop. And um, was that before or after you lived in Driffield Road? That was my mother had lived in Driffield Road for a short while, yeah, yeah. Um, but eventually moved here. Mm -hmm. uh, my aunt continued to live in Driffield Road right. for the whole period, and yeah. then we went to back to live in Driffield Road yeah. afterwards when mm -hmm. we were getting a little bit grown yeah. up. The my first involvement was to. In the days of coupons, particularly, uh, socks were very often refooted, so that people who bought knitted socks from us, after a while, would wear the feet out and would bring them back. And the old feet used to be cut off and new feet so uh, stitched on. This saved coupons and it saved money at a time when raw materials were scarce during the war. And the stocking feet that were cut off the waist provided my pocket money because I used to take them to Sugden's yard <laughs> for, um, I used to get scrubbing stone and usually threepence or sixpence perhaps uh, for the scrap. In the Korean War in 1951, I can remember uh, when the price of raw wool trebled and quadrupled overnight, uh, the sixpence turned into quite a few shillings mm. and I thought I was into a gold mine but I wasn't allowed to keep it. <laughs> <laughs> For eight years and this in fact where I'm standing now was where my bed was um, and my brother used to sleep on that side and we slept head to tail as it were. Uh, oh, lots of happy memories of here uh, and some perhaps sad ones in a sense mm. because I think the most traumatic thing that happened to me in my life was the fact that I was one of the first children in Prescott to catch polio mm. and uh, I, when I was seven mm. I too killed with polio mm. and that um, I suppose changed the course of my life to some extent because whilst I was one of the lucky ones uh, it did leave me lame in my right foot and I wasn't able to be as good a footballer as I would have liked to have been. Mm. I was always very keen on football. Mm -hmm. uh, I suppose in a sense uh, it helped me to be determined in life because I never liked people. I would never liked to be different to other people no. and I never liked people to make it easy for me mm -hmm. uh, or to give me a start. Well, it certainly paid yeah, off in your right. case because yeah. you've done all sorts of things that I know of yeah. in the church and, uh, and in the town generally and, mm -hmm. and, and that's important. Yeah, well, we began from small beginnings, and I, I mean, I enjoy being with customers. I mean, my favourite job is being behind the counter. Yeah. I don't spend as much time as I would like because of all the admin work that we have to do these yeah. days, but yeah. uh, that's my favourite pastime. And it's amazing how many people come into this shop and will say, I remember you when you were going to school, or I remember you when... You were quite small and couldn't see over the counter. Yeah, that's true. And a succession of people. And before that, mm, yes. had bought knitting wool, and, uh, and you've been on on the spot to uh, yes. advise them and, uh, mm. and well, generally help. Mm, that's right. Yeah. As a result of that, you must you must know quite a lot of people in this town. Oh, I do indeed. Particularly yes. the ladies. It's yeah. always a, uh, difficult to remember names I sometimes, know. and I you know. get very embarrassed by that's them. Right. Yeah, that's right. We were talking a little while ago. Mm. And the number of folk who uh, speak to me as I walk down the, the street is, is absolutely legion. Mm. And I can't place them all. And, and in fact, we've got into the habit now, if we're out together and somebody says, hello, Arthur, and my wife says, me, I say, well, I don't know. And she said, well, you probably taught her in, so in Sunday school. That's right. <laughs> That's absolutely. Yes. Yeah. That's what happens. Yeah. Still, yeah. it's a nice, a nice connection and a nice association, isn't it? Yes, oh, it is. It's I mean, I think Prescott people are very loyal, they are wonderful indeed. people. Yeah. And they're a friendly lot. Yes, mm. yeah, that's right. Mm. Well, that's grand, David. Thank you very yeah. much for showing us your, your original abode. And that's right. That. That's great. Yeah.
Jeff and Brian Nilty own a general store situated on Warrington Road in Prescott. Yep. I've just got to the central thing with uh, David Rose. Uh, and Mr. My first wife used to take him to Sunday school. Uh, I remember it very well. Yeah. So, uh, in fact, I'll tell you what I first remember. When I was a young boy in the choir at church, I always remember that she used to wear the, the colours to go with the seasons. Is that right? That's right. Church, I remember that. She was the only person I ever remember doing yeah, that. Yeah, that's right. And she sang, and she was a good singer, she right. sang soprano. Yeah. yeah she, her sister was mezzo soprano. And Dolly Gardner was there. You're talking in the 50s now, though, I aren't know, you? I know, I know. I do that's remember it very well. Yeah, that's going back. Anyhow, what we mainly want to talk to you about is your recollections of the grammar school. Well, I mean, you were a leading light there mm -hmm. on the football team, and graded up from there to, to all sorts of higher things. Well, uh, so well I think very, very first of all, I was born and brought up in, in, in Grosvenor Road, Jig Street. It's an old part of Prescott. Um, and probably... Uh, Oh, uh, the place I learned the football, apart from the streets, was on the Gram School. Yeah. In the time before I actually joined the school, we used to go on at nights and at weekends when the school wasn't was amusing, obviously. Yeah. And a lot of the skills you talk about, perhaps I, I first learned on, on the Gram School. So I was more than aware of watching the boys from a distance, even before I joined the school. Sure. But uh, when, when I did pass the 11 plus from Mirror Road and went to, uh, to PGS, 1960, yeah. um, there were lots of things which straight away struck you as being in, football was an important thing. The very first thing you noticed was the, the presence of the shield yeah. under the school clock on the, the south cor corridor. Massive silver shield which um, yeah, I'd never seen the light before in my life and, and it was almost a fixture. We had it every year yeah. and you were cert soon made aware of the fact that uh, Preston Grammar School senior side was the best on Merseyside. Right. And, um, and had been for many years. Yeah. Yeah. And also on that south corridor remember there were lots and lots of photographs going back to the, the early 19, 1900s yeah. um, of the teams, the football, cricket. Right. Well, it was a great tradition in, in sports at PGS. Yeah. And in fact, my own my own uncle, Fred Finney, uh, was in the football team. So I was, again, there's, there's a link there. Yeah. And other people that I knew about the town, Alan Acourt as well, obviously, yeah. I mustn't forget, yeah. who was an England player, yeah, who I was aware of, who played for England, and he had attended Preston Grammar School. So yeah. he was very important. Um, so we've turned out some good stuff. Oh, Actually, excellent stuff. No, it's no surprise though, when I, when I first went there, there were at least, at the lunch at uh, break times, you would probably see anywhere up to 10 or 15 games of football going on in the yard. Yeah. It was the exclusive preserve <laughs> of football teams, yeah. all with a small ball, That's right. uh, which again helps to sort of improve your skill. Yeah. And it was just a, a, a massive bodies yeah. playing football 15 right. minutes. And didn't it overflow into, into the field? Well, lunchtime, I, yeah. I can often remember lunchtime, people used to do all sorts of things to try and get on first sitting. If you got on first sitting, you, you were out for, 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 for ten to one, yeah. and you got a full hour of football then until yeah. ten to two. And people would come back bathed in sweat and sit through the classes all afternoon, but wouldn't bat an eyelid. No. I mean, it was most important to play football, and uh, it, was, it was a very big thing at that time. Uh, th th this is predating uh, your, your time, your connection there. I, I was at the grammar school from 1922 to 1926. In fact, I had the first two years at the old school at Moss Street, and we used to use Metcalfe's farm. As it was. Uh, as it was, uh, uh, as the uh, playing fields. And when eventually I went in 24 to the new school, uh, the, I think the man, well, the man there was, was uh, C. W. H. Richardson. I've seen well, he photographed, I could pick him out now, Richie, yeah. And he was followed by R.S. Briggs, who went to Spencer live in, Briggs. The, in the farmhouse. That's right. And Spencer Briggs and I had many connections together. In fact, when I was made a church warden, 1952, they, they gave me the parish room to look after. And I said, well, I'm not doing it on, on my own, I want a committee. And Iris Briggs was the chairman of the finance committee, so I raked him in there, and he and I were in, in very close contact. Well, one of the happiest memories I have is when they used to do the, the garden fetch for the church at, at U, is it U, U, U Tree Cottage, that's U Tree right, House, that's right. on yeah. the corner. I yeah. mean, a marvellous big house with right. a pond and right. stables, yeah. lovely right. mature trees. Yeah. I mean, it's gone now, but uh, it was there until, what, middle 60s, I think, it been, before it was demolished. It was a lovely grand house which, which went with the job of headmaster, of course. Right. And they waited until he retired, I think, before they pulled it down. That's right. And he went to live in Olmsco, just outside Olmsco. But on a footballing note, when, when the, the first year that I was at the school, again, something reinforced it, the, the senior shield was then played for at Goodison Park oh. every year. Uh -huh. And um, the very first year I, I, I was at the school, as an under-12, as it were, we, we were all bussed out to Goodison Park and watched a near deserted stadium with both sets of 
of pupils from Collegiate College yeah. in Liverpool and, yeah. and Preston Grammar School, yeah. and, and our team won 2-1. Okay. So again, there was, a, there was a possibility, a, a slight chance you might actually appear at Goodison Park <laughs> at some stage in the future if you were good enough. So extra incentive, yeah. I and mean, little was I to know at that time that I would actually play for Everton Football Club one day, you know, Absolutely. although in a, in a, in much in a, in a minor role, yeah. as it were. But, but then you graded up to Newcastle, didn't you? Well, I, well I, to tell the tale properly, when I was at school, I mean, one of the things you try to put into people's mind these days is the, the amount of interest. I mean, there were no other sports to play at school when I was a boy, yeah. um, or at least winter sports. You were either footballer or you, you were nothing, so everybody everybody wanted to play. And I first started, there was a boy in my class as a 13-year-old who played for a team called Rainford North End, a boy called Stuart McIntosh. Yeah. And he was a lot bigger boy than me, he was in goals, he was goalkeeper and wicketkeeper every year. And I used to go to his house in Rainford, which was two buses then, two, one into St. Helens and out to Rainford. And he already at 13 played for the local Open Age League, which was um, Rainford North End, yeah. the team was called, played at Bushy Lane. Nice. And the year after I followed him then, as a 14 year old, I played in the Ormskirk and District League and in, in the first team they had, which was played in the Liverpool County Combination, which was a very good standard. And um, I made progress into the first team by the time I was 15. And there was a master at school called Mr. Dewsniff, the metalwork master, who had a great interest in football. And he, at that time, was playing um, for St. Alice Town, yeah. the Lancashire Combination, which was one rung beneath 4th Division. Yeah. And he poached me, I suppose you'd say. Yeah. And I eventually signed for St. Alice Town as about a 15-year-old and made my debut in the Lancashire Combination. As I said, it was a wonderful standard then. People like Harry Drysdale had played, yeah. Yeah. who I do as an, an old press coach, was a wonderful player. And um, I played there for a year or two and had an opportunity then to go to Stoke City. Yeah. had a year in Stoke City as a full-time professional on leaving school. Yeah. Um, but really I made my mark at Burnley Football Club. That was the first big club that I went yeah. to, I called it a big club. I was very fortunate to um, be with the people there. The, the side that I went in 1968, they just won the, the FA Youth Cup. And people like young Michael Doherty, Tommy Doherty's son was there. Lots of other players who subsequently were sold for large sums of money all in excess of 100,000 and I, I luckily became one of them when I, uh, I went to Newcastle United for about 130,000 which I mean it doesn't sound so much these days but yeah. the record at that time was about 300,000 in fact yeah. Martin Dobson was the record I think from Burnley to Everton yeah. and I went in the other direction to Newcastle United two months later um, I had four, four very happy years at Newcastle um, four as captain uh, when we reached the um, Football League Cup final had the best league placing for an awful long time and fully enjoyed the trip up there. Mm -hmm. And then came back down, home as it were, to yeah. Evan, 1978. Uh, had one and a half years and then an injury in, a, in the derby game yeah. um, stopped me from playing anymore. Mm -hmm. So it was, um, I mean, football's a roller coaster and you Check expect the ups and downs. Oh, yeah. Yes, indeed. But it uh, ended up where I really wanted to end up, which was back in Pesco. Yeah. Toes were in my home. Yeah. And, um, well, Pres Prescott turned out some very good footballers. I'm thinking now of Eddie Kilshaw, who used to play for Bury. He's one of the best customers in the shop here. Is he really? He is, yes. Well, well, well. <laughs> I mean, his mother had, had the, the Swan Hotel at the bottom of Derby Street. That's right. Uh, and he, he, he used to be a pal of my youngest brother, who died a couple. Uh, and I, I remember Eddie was never satisfied to sit in the house. He would always be kicking a ball around. And, yeah, in the stable yard and all that. And he went, didn't he go to Sheffield Wednesday? I think he did. Sheffield Wednesday, did. and then yeah. injury stopped then his injury career. Stopped him, yeah. And he became a teacher. That's right, he became a teacher, yeah. yeah. So we've, we've done very well for us, haven't we? Well, I think it's, it's, it's I been think a bit of source of inspiration to me. I mean, there sure, yeah. are lots of things. I mean, as I say, the, the, the whole town was different then. In, in, when I was a say, young boy, I can well remember at lunchtime, having played at school in the morning, yeah. Looking forward to another game in the afternoon at Rainford, yeah. and there was a certain buzz about the town, which isn't there anymore on a Saturday. Right. I mean, there were, there were buses then used to go from the Open Anchor, open anchor right. to watch a Liverpool or Everton alternate yeah. weeks. Yeah. Uh, not many people had cars in those days, yeah. Yeah. and even the side that played represented the BICC then yeah. was a formidable outfit. I mean, you were talking picking from the best of 10,000 workers, yeah. all um, very interested in football, very interested and knowledgeable, yeah. and it was an excellent side that the, the BI first team had in those, year, those days. And a wonderful stadium down the down Warrington Road, now, now the, the leisure centre. Yeah, that's looking back to your business, that, that's gone from strength to strength. Right? Well, it does well. Going. We're very fortunate, we're in a good position, I think, that's the most important thing. You transformed this area altogether, I mean, the chapel was here before you, 
sort of sat down. Lacked a bit. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> when you, when you uh, had your new signboard put up there. Yeah. That, that showed... Uh, well, we wanted to go the right direction. Well, sure. exactly. And you've gone that way. I mean, we're, we're waiting now for the builder to arrive any day now. We're hoping to... Well, we, we've already acquired the, the property next door. Yeah. But um, we're all set to knock through and make the shop probably well, almost twice as big. Mm -hmm. I'm sure the, the business that we've enjoyed so far will, will merit it. Right. I'm sure it will go from strength to strength. Blundell's Files and Tools Limited is one of the oldest surviving companies in Prescott. Some of the old, traditional manufacturing crafts are still employed. The proprietor, Mr Ken Blundell, has been kind enough to grant us an interview. Grundle will be uh, uh, remembered long in this town for, for the interest and in, uh, application in, in file making here. Yes, uh, 1864 was when the firm was first started by my great grandfather. 1864. And uh, when I started work 50 odd years ago, there were at least half a dozen small file making concerns in the town. Oh, yes, yes. Some of them were only one man businesses. People like Tom Byron. Tom Byron yeah. had three or four workers. Pivers was in there. Yeah. and uh, Joe Preston so in uh, right. Horton Street. Yeah. Yeah. He had uh, three or four workers. But uh, in Great Britain, Great Britain uh, altogether there were about 60 fire manufacturers. Okay. Uh, they've been whittled away slowly over the years and now we're the only ones left. Yeah. I don't know whether this proves we're more resilient or just more stupid, but uh, yeah. all the others have closed down yeah. because competition from abroad is now so intense that uh, right. it's very... Pattern everywhere, isn't it? It's uh, the yeah. same in old tool making. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. uh, one of the most uh, promising or forging ahead uh, markets uh, uh, production uh, wise in this area now is China mm. because they're turning out good quality tools at a very very low price and uh, we just cannot compete with them. In fact we're using some ourselves in our own sales. Yeah. Uh, now. It's the old story isn't it? I mean, the people it's who were, were down and out before and now have, have acquired It's the true. Uh, and file, a file is one of the first uh, produced in a developing country. Yeah. They make yeah, hammers sure and is, yeah. dry saws and yeah, things like that. Right. And the file is uh, quite high up on the list yeah. for uh, basic uh, engineering. Yes, yeah, sir. Sure. When and you consider the, the, the value of, uh, of the expertise that the Japanese are throwing into the market and the Chinese too, yeah. I mean, in, in the way of cars and, and, and uh, electronic devices quite, and uh, lots of things. And I was interested to notice that some of your files are uh, uh, for the electronics trade too. Oh yes, uh, yeah. the files that we produce yeah. uh, in Prescott, and I say that because uh, half of our sales now are files we do not produce. We buy them in from yeah. abroad, yeah. the big files. Yeah. Uh, in fact, there are no big files made in Great Britain at all now. Mm -hmm. We specialise in the small ones yeah. and buy in the big ones. Yeah. Uh, but the, our files in general are distributed throughout 
every type of industry, yeah, electrical be. industry, the yeah. motor, motor industry, yeah, and sure. the jeweler's trade, and things so like that. That uh, brings an interesting fact in, in, in my mind. Uh, there was a, a, a chap in Horton Street, I think, or Beaton Street Street, who was a, a jewel expert with the watch business. And um, Gore, uh, Gore, Teddy Gore, oh, yes, Ted Gore. And uh, uh, they were for the movements of watches, weren't they? They, they were. were. He, what he made were uh, called brooches. Yeah. Now these are not he, the brooches, the decorative brooches. No, no. Brooches. He was called a brooch maker. He was a brooch maker. Yeah, that's right. And a brooch is a tapered steel tool, very similar in appearance to a file, yeah. but it doesn't have teeth on, uh -huh. and they have five sides on them. Yeah. And Teddy Gore was the last, uh, as you say. Yeah. Uh, hand uh, brooch maker in the yeah. country. In fact, he spent his last 10 years uh, of his working life working for us, mm. yes, mm. on our premises. Yeah. Uh, and there was, at that time, well, we're going back 20 years now, uh, still then a considerable demand for these brooches. Mm. And the brooches, uh, being uh, five-sided and uh, made of hardened steel, mm. were used to enlarge holes in the brass Oh, movements of watches. Yeah. They would just poke a little fine yeah. point in and twist them by hand, yeah. Yeah. and they would ream out the hole to a yeah. larger size. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Teddy Gore used to make these things down to a tremendously fine limits. Yeah. Uh, I've seen them as fine as ten thousand in thickness, yeah. tapering to a point. Yeah. And when I tell you that uh, he would uh, take a piece of steel and put it in a hand vise, yeah. And first of all, he would taper it with a file yeah. and turning his hand all the time so he would have a, a perfectly round yeah. point, yeah. just like a pencil point, yeah. only long and slender. Yeah. And then he would file one flat on to this piece of steel, then turn his wrist 72 degrees and file another flat, mm -hmm. then turn his wrist again another 72 yeah. degrees or re grip the, the yeah. hand vise. And in a very quick five movements, mm -hmm. he would put five flats on this brooch. Mm -hmm. And when I tell you that the brooch can be as little as ten thou in diameter, mm -hmm. it was a tremendously skilled operation. Must have been. Must have been. It must have been uh, boring on the eyes too. Uh, I think uh, the BBC came out once and took uh, a video or movie film, as it was then, of uh, Ted doing this job. But I, b I believe they've lost the film. Mm -hmm. or, They've disappeared in the archive somewhere yeah, because yeah, it was yeah. the most interesting uh, yeah. thing to see. Yeah, sure. It's yeah. one of the most skilled hunted jobs I've, I've ever seen. Yeah. Yeah. And Ted spent all his life. In fact, he had his brother working for him with him for a long time. Didn't his father? Have it before and his father I thought before him. Yeah. In, in one of my books, I've got a picture of his father's wedding. Uh, oh, really? It's a very ancient thing. Oh. And, and the two and, and somewhere in the back of Beacon Street Street, yeah. where, where they were standing, uh, husband and wife standing in, in, yeah. in the yard at the back, and there's a door behind. Him. But um, I, I thought he was, he was in the business too, as well as uh, Ted and, and his brother. I've not heard of any demand for brooches uh, nowadays mm -hmm. uh, in the watch trade, but then of course all watches, are, well nearly all watches, are digital now, aren't they? What's that? And, uh, What's that? It was rather interesting, last week, a uh, fortnight ago, I was in Switzerland uh, visiting a fire manufacturing company there, our biggest competitor in fact, mm -hmm. a very big company. Uh, and we were discussing the advent of file making in their area as it was here in the watchmaking area. Yeah. And uh, the Swiss watches, of course, were as popular as well, well known. They superseded the Prescott watches, didn't they? And they exactly. were out of business. And they, things have overtaken them now, just as they so overtook the Prescott yeah. industry. Mm -hmm. And all the watchmaking industries in Switzerland. 10, 15 years ago I used to employ 30,000 people and now it's down to single figures I believe because the watchmaking factories that they do have are automated to such an extent that they need very few uh, workers in them. It's, uh, it's not remarkable really, isn't yeah, it? it is. The parallel of course is BICC, isn't it? Quite. I mean, uh, in, right. in the days when I worked, yeah, yes. it isn't all that long ago, 15,000 on the payroll. That's right. And that is 5,000 there in, in, in the whole of the... Not, not uh, in Prescott, I mean, not yes. so many here know. Uh, I mean, uh, and we've just uh, driven past that. Right. The place is as flat as a place. It is, yes. It's incredible, isn't it? It is. It is.
they're still as strong in other fields of course. Oh, of course they are. I mean, they're they a fantastic oh. successful company. And absolutely, yes. They just yeah. developed uh, in another direction. That's right. I suppose it was, it was uh, uneconomic. And, uh, yes, uh, it took too long. Well, we ourselves are finding that uh, files alone uh, are difficult to exist on. Yeah. And we're expanding into other products yeah. on a resale basis. Yeah. In fact, I would say our, half our sales now are uh, in goods other than those we produce ourselves. Mm -hmm. times, I suppose. So I'm um, afraid we are a declining industry. Yeah. Uh, but how long we can go on manufacturing? I just do not know. Well, I hope the, the, the end is not imminent. But uh, Philip, who just uh, taking you around the factory, yeah. is uh, together with my son, yeah. the fifth generation. And uh, whether there'll be a sixth generation, well, that's a bit of a record. Yeah. Well, that sort of thing to go on for five generations. Mm. I mean, yeah. the quality, it, it bespeaks the quality of the, of the work you turned out. No question. Stone masonry is another traditional craft carried out in Prescott. At Lyons Stone Masons, we see Colin Macy giving us a demonstration of his craft. time since, since I, I, I came into a place like this and I, I, I haven't gone into detail but that's, that's a, a, a nice detail. That's right, yes, it is in a way. And my connection with this before was that as a parish clerk in Manchester, I had a very strong connection with Mr. Hamilton. Yes. Uh, Mr. Hamilton was the chief clerk of the Manchester Parish Council. Yes. And uh, he was very kind to me. Yes. And 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 he was very k
Mr. First will apply to the bishop. That's right. They still do that now to this day. Yeah. That's right. And in the case of the uh, cemetery, through the, the uh, Argus Cemetery Registrar, they, they applied through the uh, commission for the council to put the stones and right. Do you still have to do that? Yes, you do. You still have to do that now. Yeah. Yeah. You have to do a drawing of it. Yes. Yeah. And you have to put the sizes. That's yes, right. And you have to write out the inscription. Okay. And there's a fee charge. That's, that's, mm -hmm. that's it. Whether it applies to the church or the religious or, or the council. The that's that's right. right, exactly. Well, that's how I came in touch with Bobby Lyon. Ah, exactly. You've known through yeah. that, yes. And the too. That's, that's right, right, exactly. They were all coming in. Of course they did. The yes. center was extending. That's right. They, they, they all wanted those yes. stones. And that's that's right. That's the regular mm -hmm. sort of thing. That's right. So that, that's, uh, that's, that's my Oh, well, yeah. And it's a good connection, that. It is, it is. It is, really, yeah. And now you can actually say that you've seen it close up. I've seen it. Yeah. No, I've not seen it. I've done before. No, that's no. right. Well, I mean, uh, I, I've, um, I served my time in this. I started 1950, and it was a place in town, in, in Liverpool itself, in Pembroke Place. It's closed now, it's, it's been closed for years. Uh, and I came up to Pestis to work for Bob Lyon in 1966. Yeah, I, 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 I was what's known as a freelance letter cutter. In other words, I worked for various firms. And he he did me, say, like uh, half a dozen inscriptions and asked me to do them, and I'd give him a price for doing them. And I used to charge him so much a letter, you see. Um, and that's how, he, that's how uh, well, I, I got paid. The, I can see the skill involved. Yes. Yeah. But yeah, look, it looks beautiful now. Yes, that's it, yeah. But when you start off, you know, it, it's all, it's just marked down, you see. And it's, you know. it's, it's all uh, material that, with a mistake yeah. made on it. Could, could oh, yes, yeah, certainly, yeah, definitely. I'm more fascinated by this. Though. Exactly, yeah. the pot stone, yeah. 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 Um, it's, it's very good. It's, yeah. you see those two it's about the second one we've had this, you know, yeah. 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 Uh, it throws out some heat. Oh, it does, it certainly yeah. does, you know. Exactly. Yeah. Ben, ben smokeless fuel. No, it's, uh, Originally coke, was it? And well, uh, yes, well, yeah. now it's, you know, some brighter, whatever they call it, you know, yeah. Well, it's, it's very nice, uh, uh, yeah. This place hasn't altered all that much. I mean, the building itself That's right. um, was, it's the original hull of the building. And the, 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 the um, only thing, it, it, obviously, is a new roof being oh, put on it. Yeah. There's been a new door being put, yeah, put, put there, yeah. but... Um, this was this is the exact size of the building and it was originally set up by uh, Tom Lyon. I remember all them years ago. Well, Tom Lyon was here mm -hmm. this very job. That's it. Sitting not in this position. Mm -hmm. uh, right round the stove on a pole. That's right, the exactly. Yeah. Uh, we chatted for hours. That's it? right, exactly. And the other thing that I was very interested in, and you told me before, is the, the material you use. I mean, you say it's white marble. It comes Italy. from Italy, northern Italy, yeah, it comes right. from Kerala. Yeah. Oh, and the granite, the, granite, the black granite, that comes from India or Africa, and occasionally you can get it from the continent, you know, but the best quality is from India or Africa. Um, and when you see it, it's grey, the granite, but once it's polished, the density makes it black, you know, because it closes right up. Which is the more uh, The granite is, a, is the hardest working stone. I mean, before marble, it, it, you know, we go back, say, before pre-First World War, yeah. um, Yorkshire stone was the most commonly used uh, in, in, in churchyards, and then it came to marble. And you'd get the granites from Scotland and Ireland, which were grey and red granites. Yeah. Um, and occasionally you'd get a black one from Scotland, the Bonacord is a black granite. Yeah. But mostly, um, now, it is granite. Yeah. Um, it's because it's become cheaper. It was very dear compared to marble, but now there's not a lot of difference between the price of the two. And the transportation charges for marble, of course. Well, in a sense, you know, um, you're talking about Italy as against, say, Africa and India. Yeah. I mean, it, it, there's not a, um, a good deal of difference in one way, you know, no. uh, with the transport, because when stone comes over, it's used as ballast, as a, as a rule, you know. But they do come in containers now, like everything else. It's uh, the docks are, you know, uh, conditioned for taking containers. Yeah. That's right, you know, and that's how the yeah. stone comes now. But I, I, I buy my stone from um, wholesalers in this country, yes. you know, uh, and that's how I do. That's it. their origin. Yeah. Uh, uh, to yeah. the wholesale. 
Now if I cut that on granite, it would be the same process, except it's a V cut and I don't um, drill it, I, I, I lay gold leaf in it, you know, which is like that's on, that's on that yes, young there, you know, and, and that's how that's done, you know. Well, that's very interesting indeed, isn't it? That's, hmm? that, that, that's certainly something. Spooner's Motorcycle Shop is an old family business. Well, Mr. Spooner, it's, um, it's not a case of asking how you got in, in, into the business. I, I know um, how it all started, but when, when did this happen? Did you say 1946? 1946, he moved into these premises. Yes. <coughs> that was just a shop. Yeah. And uh, he did cycle repairs in the cellar, oh. the cellar underneath. I see. And uh, what, what was it just you found? Or, 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 uh, my mother, mother and father. Oh, yeah. I remember a funny story about that uh, associated with the, the motor firm. Somebody was saying that uh, your mother had given your father some money for a specific purpose. I don't know what it was. And she asked him what he'd done with it. He said, that, that's the money you gave me. He's brought it up and down inside my engine. So uh, that, that yeah, was quite cool of the interest of this, for the reason that you mentioned earlier, to notice how many different things were not present, but I think it was you were surprised in this area. The sculling phase is uh, yeah. when he first started, he, he started with uh, XWD, more ministry yeah. uh, option stuff, and uh -huh. um, then he took on cycles, uh -huh. and he went into motorcycles. And in the late 50s, there was a scooter craze and I'm left with it. Yeah. So it was well, right across the board that his experience was mm. uh, engaged. Mm. Okay. Well, it's fine. Oh well, it's, it's nice to come in and see a place being used. I mean, so many places now have got the shutters up and uh, nothing going on, but you've still got something going. That's, that's well, we just mainly do MLTs and. Mm. Uh, repairs now, there's not much uh, call for sales. No, so. it's mm -hmm. of MRTs. Yeah.